Well, greetings. David Arendelle here. I'm excited to share about another research project that we're nearly complete with and almost ready to send off to a uh, publisher for consideration. It's um, March 2019 at this point. This was a surprise research study. Whenever we did a study of our facilitators at the University of Minnesota, it was a grounded project. We didn't have a lot of suppositions going in. We simply wanted to do data collection using rigorous qualitative methods in order to find out what was the experience for the peer facilitators. This whole issue about leader identity was something that we did not anticipate was going to come up. So we're really excited to be able to share it with you. Amanda Haney was my graduate research assistant and we really had a lot of fun um, and really felt very uh, that we had come up with some important findings through this research study. Once again, the whole issue about whether or not people develop uh, leader experiences and they develop leadership skills, that is not new. There's more than 50 studies out there that have already identified this whole thing about leadership skill development. What we wanted to get to was we wanted to get to this issue of why. Why was it that this was occurring? And in particular, why was it that the facilitators were thinking differently about themselves? So if you'd like to be able to see these other 50 studies, please go to the bibliography website. You'll be able to find a link inside of there, and you can download the annotated bibliography of those 50 studies, many of which are available online. I have the uh, website uh, links inside of the bibliographic citations. Well, this whole issue about leadership identity development, well, what we did is that once we collected all this data, found that this issue about students thinking of themselves differently, we went to the leadership base, and this was the model which we went to. It's the LID model. Looking at these stages, the authors here are the most prominent in the field of leadership or leader identity development. What they said was that leaders go through six phases. Now, for purposes of this YouTube video, I have to refer you off to uh, read their bigger study in order to understand this more deeply. But let me just give you the quick thumbnail version. As tiny children, we recognize there's authority figures out there. Generally, it's parents. Then, whenever we're in school, well, we start to explore and engage with other leaders. Primarily, that'd be the teachers. Then we started to notice that some people are appointed into positions of power. Then we end up seeing that the next stage in their uh, model is that we begin to see that people, rather than just ordering other people around, they try to influence people instead. And then finally, in the fifth stage here, they end up shifting the leadership position to others by helping them to develop their own agency or their own power. And now all of a sudden, rather than a person who used to be appointed with power, well, now we see that other people inside the group are exercising leadership or have developed their own leader identity. And then finally off to the sixth phase. What we believe has occurred within our facilitator program, and we think this occurs with programs across the uh, country or the world, is that this is what happens inside of a peer learning program whenever you train the facilitators to literally facilitate, not order, not give information, but actually help students to be able to find the information that they need, build up their strength as a, um, an individual who has their own agency to be able to take care of themselves, be a stronger learner independently, being able to access external resources, be better at being able to take lecture notes and to be able to have more critical view whenever they review the assigned materials. We think that this is the place where the facilitators actually have this shift of power occur 
and they begin learning more things about themselves as a result of this experience. Many themes have popped up, and I need to uh, give a heads up on this. This manuscript is not done yet. Some of these themes may change. Perhaps one or two of them will drop out because we need to have enough of the 43 facilitators to have agreed that this particular theme is true of their behavior and of their thought patterns. So, but at least these are the ones that we have thus far then. Trying to understand why is it that people would begin to see themselves as leaders, well, what we started to look at is things that you do are a catalyst for how you begin to perceive yourself. And if you begin having success in leadership roles, then you begin to think that it's not just simply you just doing a job description. You start thinking of yourself a little bit differently. And you see yourself as a leader. And that's much different than just simply being appointed to a leadership position. You now think about yourself differently. We think that part of the reason why this catalyst for change on how these facilitators thought about himself was the structure of the peer learning program. I'm not going to go through and examine all this in detail in this rather short YouTube video, but what we think is that the way that these learning groups are structured, well, that creates an environment for them to be able to suddenly start to shift and they shift themselves into this facilitating role rather than dispensing information. And you see them starting to develop leadership skills and identity among the other participating students. So that's the reason why we say the structure of the learning group actually serves as this environment then. Student feedback almost uniformly is going to be positive for the facilitators. There's lots of complicated reasons why we could spend a whole nother YouTube video exploring that, but this positive feedback is reinforcing for the, the facilitators seeing themselves as a leader. They start seeing that external people are now telling them that they have a leadership or a leader identity. So you already had this was occurring up here in the first theme. Well, this one is a different group of people who are giving you this feedback then. Most often people see themselves as stewards of knowledge rather than people who are just knowledge experts. That's the reason why this moves away from that appointed position of being the leader. I know information. You students do not. You need to listen to me. Well, that's not the way that peer learning groups work. And then finally, they oftentimes feel relatively surprised about the success that occurs in working with students. Because for many of these facilitators, this is the first time that they have ever been in a role like this. And that's the reason why for them, it's a rather transformational process. It's a developmental activity that occurs. This is not something that was on the job description. This was not something that we promoted to the facilitators was going to occur. As I said, this is a grounded research project. This is what the facilitators told us with some rather open-ended prompts for them to talk about what was this experience like. So what are some of the things that help to make this atmosphere for people to develop a leader identity? I won't go through and read through all the PowerPoint slides. I um, make a promise to my students not to read them all out loud. But I can just simply maybe point down to this one down here at the bottom. They're all equally important. But I think part of it are the weekly journals and the team meetings with their fellow facilitators. It gives an opportunity for people to be able to think and to reflect. You know, I've read more and more in the professional literature that the most powerful things that can happen for a student inside of a class is not when there's an activity going on, not when the teacher is talking. It's actually whenever they're working by themselves and they're maybe writing a paragraph summary of what they learned for the week and what it meant to them, 
or much longer activities. But this whole thing about reflection is becoming really clear in the literature is one of the most powerful things. If you want to make the class meaningful to students, integrate it into them, and have it to be a difference in the years to come. I really started shifting my course, uh, my global history class that I teach. I started shifting more and more of this reflection time about three years ago. And student reaction to that, even though they do kind of complain a little bit about there's a lot of writing in here, what they do say is that we appreciate that we get an opportunity to express ourselves rather than just simply responding to questions, either on exams or during class sessions. This opportunity for them to take ownership of their learning is really critical for the students, and it's also critical for the facilitators. So what's the implication of all of this? Well, once again, as I talked about with the vocational identity development, well, this is more than just simply a PAL study group. It's a co-curricular college student development activity. That's what's really pretty remarkable about this, is that this is much more. As I said in the first video in this four-part series, people never really thought about what is it that the facilitators get out of the experience other than a paycheck and a couple of lines in their resume. It was all about the participants. What we now understand is that this is co-curricular for not only for the facilitators, it's a whole nother paper that we looked at in terms of what are the participants getting out of the experience more than just getting higher grades and persisting longer. It becomes a living laboratory for students to be able to exercise some of this leader identity. To have some failures, but also have a lot of successes also get a lot of feedback, most of it positive, from the students for what they're up to. And the implication is that this idea about self-concept, and that is not uh, written about much in the professional literature. As I said, there's 50 studies that mention that leadership skills are developed as a result of participation in a facilitator program, but none of them talk about this whole idea about self-concept. Well, I'll correct myself. There is one. There was here, it's in probably 2018, there was a dissertation study done. So let's be fair about this. We just simply are not aware of other studies that really have examined this whole issue about identity development inside of study uh, group programs. So what are some possible changes for peer learning programs? Well, you could integrate a little bit of this into the training program, either through some readings, through some discussions. Maybe you invite someone who's maybe perhaps in charge of offering a class on campus for leadership skill or leadership identity development. Some uh, schools, like ours, has an academic minor in leadership skills. Nearly a quarter of all of our first-year students enroll in that minor because they perceive it's very popular, it's very energized. They also see it as a great way to prepare themselves for nearly any occupation which they're going to pursue. This doesn't have to take a lot of time to integrate this in. This could be maybe one of your team meetings. Maybe you spend maybe 15 to 20 minutes talking about it. Maybe during the initial two or three day training workshop, maybe you spend 10 or 15 minutes talking about this. Part of what we need to do is to give them some language and some key phrases for them to think about, and it can help them to be able to develop that. And that's the reason why, as I've mentioned in other places, giving them spaces for them to reflect. And when we talk about reflective journals, we're only asking, as a recommendation, like what we've done, only one out of the 10 weekly journal entries, we have a couple of prompting questions about how do you see yourself now? Uh, what kinds of skills have you developed? And students explore that on their own, but we're not asking that you change the whole program around in order to emphasize leadership skill development. 
What we think you can do is that you can tweak it just a little bit. You can provide some of these places, whether it's inside of the team meetings that meet every, hopefully every two to three weeks. Some programs actually meet more often. Or inside of reflective journals that give some spaces for the students to think. As I said, it's been really transformational inside of my global history course. I really believe the students walk out of my class now and they're going to remember the key concepts. They're not going to remember who, what, where, but what they are going to be thinking about is why and what differences it make to them. The peer learning program could be broadened in scope. We could emphasize this whole issue about leadership development up here as one of the reasons why people should consider pursuing this as a part-time job. It's pretty difficult with all the jobs that are on campus. Why is it that they want to select this particular occupation? Well, maybe this will be another way for you to be able to encourage people to apply for the positions. There's lots of other people who are going to be involved on campus that can be a resource for you. Maybe you're not comfortable leading some of those discussions about leader identity emergence and such. Well, maybe we can find someone out of the counseling office. Or if you're lucky enough to have a course or an academic minor involved with leadership skill development, maybe one of those people could help participate. I think positioning our programs as co-curricular venues is really important because your program is more important than just helping students to get higher grades and to persist longer, even though that's the bread and butter of why people implement these programs. It's also emphasizing this is a great experience development for the facilitators. There's a lot more that's going on. There's actually things that are going on among the participants in addition to getting higher grades. Not enough room to talk about those at this point, but simply starting to build the case for where your program fits at is really critical. Well, lots of places to pursue more information on this and other peer learning programs. I've already talked about this on some of the other YouTube um, uh, videos, so I'm just going to briefly note uh, checking out some of the web links here, the uh, YouTube video channel, obviously, the um, podcast, the bibliography, there's 1,400 plus publications, and those are just about the six major um, national or international peer learning programs, supplemental instruction, peer-led team learning, emerging scholars program, structured learning assistance, and the rest. And also, I'd be more than delighted to visit with you. Here's my phone number and here's my email. I just think that peer learning programs have so much more that's going on inside of them. And I think it is a great way for us to position ourselves as critical members of the student development community. Thanks for listening.